forward. Um, good morning, everybody. It's uh, a little odd to be in this kind of uh, session with, uh, with our panelists, uh, but we don't see an audience at least. Um, I'm assuming that there are people in the ether somewhere that are, uh, that are, that are looking at this. Um, this session, for, uh, for those who hopped on and, and didn't realize it, is called Sister Cities, uh, Meet and Greet, Get Deep and Go Far. So uh, I'm not sure how each of our panelists are gonna interpret that, um, uh, that title, but we'll see who, uh, who gets deep and goes far uh, in the session. Um, so I'd like to just sort of lay out how we're gonna try to do this uh, this morning. Uh, as you can see, we have a number of, um, uh, of panelists. In fact, uh, once we're all here, and we're still, I think, trying to get one more on, uh, we'll have six, uh, six panelists, and we only have an hour, uh, and this is a particularly interesting um, uh, topic. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that we'll be able to get through uh, everything. Excuse me, my phone is ringing. This is this is the age of um, uh, of Zoom and uh, uh, all sorts of other things where you see dogs and phones and lots of stuff in the background. Um, so what we're going to try to do is um, is each of us uh, will do a sort of five minutes, um, and then uh, we will have ten or fifteen minutes. So that should go for about thirty minutes. We'll have 10 or 15 minutes of, I'll throw a question out, the panelists will discuss it, uh, and then we will open it up, and I assume in the uh, uh, typed session to the right, uh, open it up to the audience with any, um, uh, with any questions. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is uh, both acknowledge and thank um, our sponsors, uh, in particular, uh, the Cleveland Public Library. Uh, you all probably know that this event was actually held at the Cleveland Public Library uh, in person uh, last year, but they are sponsoring it uh, this year, and we uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Felton Thomas, who's the director of the Cleveland uh, Public Library, has been a real supporter of uh, both Global Cleveland and the Sister Cities uh, relationship. Uh, for those of you who want to see Felton, he's on a panel uh, at 11 o'clock um, after this. Uh, I also want to uh, thank and acknowledge our other um, sponsors, Platform Brewery, uh, the Downtown Cleveland Alliance, Supply Side Group, uh, the law firm of Ulmer and Byrne, uh, the Rotary Club, Club of Cleveland, uh, Eaton Corporation, uh, Taiwan Sister Cities, uh, the Council on International Programs, Margaret Wong and Associates, Team Neo, the Peace Corps, uh, 12 Literary Arts, and Growth Ops. Um, it's a big list. And uh, first of all, thank you to all the, uh, the sponsors. But I think what it says is that uh, this kind of relationship and outreach in sister cities and around the world is something that uh, organizations in Cleveland and organizations uh, uh, around the world, you can see some of those aren't Cleveland-based organizations, uh, want to uh, want to be part of and want to support. Uh, and we thank you, uh, thank you for that. So um, uh, my name is David Fleschler. I am the Vice Provost for International Affairs at Case Western Reserve University. Um, those of you who um, don't know Case Western Reserve University should know that we just hosted the uh, first uh, U.S. presidential debate um, two days ago. Uh, I'm not sure that the, uh, the, that the presidential contenders um, uh, did well for themselves, uh, but I do think that the, uh, the background and the, uh, the sound, uh, all of that worked very well, and that was what Case Western Reserve uh, was part of. So um, uh, that may be where you've, uh, you've heard of us uh, most recently. Um, what I'd like now to do is very, very quickly, um, in, in sort of one sentence, introduce our panelists uh, and then go to them for a, uh, a deeper introduction uh, of themselves and, um, uh, and then uh, go to a couple of, uh, so they can go to a couple of issues. Uh, so first, and, and in my screen at least, is on the top, uh, is George Dion. 
who's at the Autonomous University of uh, Puebla in Puebla, Mexico. And he's also uh, part of Aim to Flourish, uh, which is it, at uh, Case Western Reserve in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, second, uh, uh, on my screen, uh, John Holcomb. Uh, John is uh, the Interim Vice Provost for Academic Programs and the Interim Dean uh, at the College of Graduate Studies at Cleveland State University here in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, the third, although she's not on, we'll hope she gets on, uh, is Elena uh, Para. Bochaya. Uh, Elena is the director of the Center of Public Diplomacy um, at Volgograd State University in Vol Volgograd, uh, Russia. So hopefully she'll be on shortly. Uh, fourth is uh, Dr. Luis uh, Gutierrez Aladro. Uh, Luis uh, serves as the academic vice president for the University of uh, Tech Milenio, um, and he's joining us from uh, Monterrey, Mexico. Um, fifth is uh, Dr. Luca uh, Zibelnik, uh, who is at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia and also at Cleveland State University uh, here in Cleveland, uh, Ohio. Uh, and finally is Dr. Ken Schneck. Uh, Ken is a professor of education and director of leadership and higher education at Baldwin Wallace University. Uh, also here, actually it's Berea, I think, isn't that right? Ken, not, uh, technically not Cleveland, uh, but Berea, Ohio, but that's really part of Cleveland. Um, so to the panelists, uh, I think the, um, the overall issue uh, that perhaps you can address in the, the few minutes that you have uh, initially is how do universities engage uh, in educational and research diplomacy? Um, both now uh, and in the future. But, but uh, for the first few minutes, what I'd like to ask you to do is introduce yourself and your institution, um, and then tell us how you've engaged in work uh, across borders uh, in educational diplomacy. And once we get to the panel discussion, we'll really try to, try to look forward. Um, so uh, why, don't, why don't we begin with, uh, with Luca, and then we'll, uh, we'll go, I'll, I'll call each one after you're done. Uh, I'm going to try to be a little better than Mike Wallace was uh, during the debate uh, and, and try to keep some time here. Uh, so I'd ask you to try to limit uh, your time to about five minutes, okay? So Luca, you're up first. Thank you. All righty, just a second so I, I can share the right screen because I have many open right now. Uh, all righty. Let me see if it starts sharing or not. Did it start sharing? University of Ljubljana, you can hear me. Perfect, because I cannot hear myself. Do not click on F5 while you are in here because it's not going to uh, it's not going to share your screen. It's going to refresh the uh, it's going to refresh your browser. So that's my mistake. Now I'm trying to share it again, um, and we are going to start. So my name is Lukas Zibelnik. I am um, sent here into the United States by the University of Ljubljana. Um, just a second, so I do the screenshot right. Again, um, uh, I'm from the Faculty of Arts of the University of Ljubljana, uh, of, and I was sent here by the Center for Slovenia as a second and foreign language, which might be of some help later on because this Center for Slovenia as, uh, as a second and foreign language cooperates with more than 60 universities around the world where we teach Slovenian language. So I, I know a little bit about uh, how the other uh, not mentioned universities here are coping with the COVID-19. Uh, University of Ljubljana is situated in Ljubljana, as, as it's logical. Uh, it's one of the smallest European cities, um, uh, capitals, uh, and it's very green city, as we heard it many, many times, this, uh, uh, this conference already situated around a uh, uh, nice uh, little river uh, where you can drink coffee, and uh, it's a very, very uh, lively city. 
Ljubljana is a, has a mixture of different cultural traditions because it was always on the crossroad of different um, of different cultures. So we have Germanic, Romantic, Hungarian, Slavic culture all together in uh, one tiny city of 106 square miles with a population of almost 300,000, which says a lot because we have a little bit uh, over uh, 40,000 students uh, in Ljubljana, which makes it a very, very young and lively, uh, youthful city uh, because of that. Uh, on, this, on the picture, you have Congress Niturk, where we have our offices uh, and meeting rooms and everything else. So you can see that we are in a beautiful building. Uh, University of Ljubljana was uh, established in 1919, so last year it was 100 years of, of opening it with five member colleges. Uh, right now it has 23 different colleges of those uh, and three, three arts academies. Uh, it covers the whole range of different uh, um, areas of expertise, so arts, fine arts, natural science, technology, engineering, social sciences, humanities humanities, medicine, health sciences, sport, and so on. As I said, uh, we have about 40,000 students. Of those, uh, we have about 5,000 international students. 3,000 are regular uh, students that come study uh, to Slovenia, and 2,000, a little bit over 2,000, there are incoming exchange students through the Erasmus, Erasmus Plus, and all of the rest of the exchange programs. This year, obviously, it's a tiny bit different. We have half of those uh, international students uh, because of the COVID and uh, majority of the universities, actually their universities for the exchange students said that they should prolong or they should uh, do it some other year, maybe. Um, this is, uh, the University of Ljubljana is a research university, uh, plus obviously we're teaching, but uh, there's a lot of researchers, so we have, uh, 4,000 registered res uh, researchers and then almost 400 young researchers with a lot of research programs that we do internationally and nationally. So you can see that almost 400 national projects and then over 500 EU projects that we are doing. Um, University of Lvalana is among top uh three percent of the universities across the world we are very proud of our teachers uh we have outstanding education we collaborate with uh different companies not only the research, research is not only based for the academia it's also uh connected uh with a lot of companies and it uh, makes transfer to the economy much easier um, it also gives Ljubljana more international community because we have a lot of exchange students still. We want more of them though. Um, so how do we support international students? First of all, we do have the lectureships around the world, as I said, more than 60 of them. They learn Slovenian language there and then uh, quite a lot of them uh, go and study in Ljubljana um because they already know the language and the culture but we also offer year plus of which i'm talking a little bit later uh tutor tutoring for international students we have all sorts of things now all online uh for for the help of them uh we counsel them via skype and so on uh we offer extracurricular activities uh sports from scuba diving to skiing and everything else together internships summer schools and so on uh, the year plus is something that we started last year, uh, so it's now two years in the in the going. It is um, offered for uh, for 300 students a year uh, that don't know any Slovenian language that they can learn. Then in that year, either um, fulfilling their study obligations with the a year plus, so these are language and culture classes, or they can actually have a possibility of prolonging their study while still keeping uh, the um, the student status so student status in slovenia it's a quite extra status because you have you have um, subsidized uh, food and so on and so on so it's it's really great and this is one of the uh, best moments that we could open this year plus uh, it is done by center for slovenia as a second and foreign language um, we offer some things also in English, uh, less things uh, in the bachelor and single cycle uh, master degree programs because only three are offered in English, but master degree programs is 43 are offered in English and then all 21 doctoral uh, degree programs are also offered in English and other languages. 
Uh, we have more than 800 classes uh, offered in English language. So if anybody wants to study, the language is not the biggest thing, but it's nice to know it still. So, Luca, I hate, I hate to do this, but we have very okay. little time. So hopefully you can wrap up in the next couple of minutes, okay? Yes, yeah, oh, no no problem, yeah. Um, so on this picture, if you just look at the picture, you can see our international partnerships and agreements uh, that are all around the world. We are still lacking in the United States, so more. Uh, so we have just 45 of them. Uh, more is better. Um, and uh, we exchange students and staff, uh, we do joint courses, we, we have all sorts of agreements, uh, memorandums of understanding and everything else. So this is about it, about, uh, about the University of Ljubljana and later on we're gonna talk uh, of other things. Thank you very much. That's wonderful, thank you, Luca. All right, why don't we uh, uh, come to the, to the US, we'll sort of go, go in and out a little bit. Um, Ken, do you wanna, uh, do you want to present? Sure. Good morning or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And you can see my cat's tail in the background because that's how we all have visitors right now. Uh, my name is Ken Schneck. I'm a professor of education at Baldwin Wallace University, which is right outside of Cleveland, Ohio. We are a university in the liberal arts tradition, though we are not technically a liberal arts school. Um, I'm also director of the Leadership and Higher Education Master's Program there, um, and that is for uh, students who want to spend um, working on college campuses as as I have done. Uh, I, came, I come to this work having worked for uh, a decade as a dean of students, um, so that is the background from which I come. And one of my roles at Baldwin Wallace, it's quite unofficial and not on my resume, uh, is that I'm the guy that they tap when something goes awry with a study abroad trip. So if a faculty member retires or uh, suddenly retires or suddenly moves or just something goes wrong, I'm the guy that they send on the study abroad trip. Uh, that is that is one of the benefits apparently of, of being a single male here with no children in Cleveland is I can just go. Uh, so in the past couple of years, I've taken students to Guatemala, I've taken students to Japan, uh, I, and I was set to go to Zambia um, this coming May. So much of what I'm working on at, at Baldwin Wallace, both in the leadership and higher education program and, and certainly through our work and study abroad is how we reimagine what it means to be engaged and what it means to take students abroad. Um, on the study abroad side, we're really re-envisioning uh, what, what a field trip looks like, what pen pals look like in a way that, that students can take control of their education. And on the leadership and higher education side, we are very much focused on racial justice and how you approach racial justice through the lens of a college campus in a way that we can't necessarily gather together and, and create the dialogue that we uh, used to be able to in, in what seems like an eon ago, but was only seven or eight months ago. So happy to talk about that more uh, as the questions come up and happy to join you all this morning. Ken, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the introduction. Uh, why don't we uh, bounce to uh, to Mexico? Luis, do you wanna do you wanna come on? Sure. Thank you. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen so I can uh, I can talk a little bit about what is Tech Millennium. My name is Luis Gutierrez. I serve as a provost for experiential education of our students. And uh, let me check, uh, talk to you a little bit about what Tech Millennial is and what we do. Uh, so Tech Millennial is a Mexican university, non-for-profit, private, uh, that was founded in 2002. So we are reaching our majority of age in Mexico, which is 18 years old. And uh, today we serve uh, 60,000 students in 31 campuses all around the country. Uh, we do have campus in Cancun, which is always the question in these uh, international forums. Uh, and we do, we, we serve a different number of population. Most of our population is uh, young students, what you call maybe traditional students. And we also serve 40% of our population in non-traditional students. Uh, we offer the last three years of high school. We also offer uh, 15 degrees of uh, bachelor degrees. We offer a uh, master degrees and uh, we are the most uh, the most numbered uh, university in Mexico with master degrees in, in management and business. Uh, 
what we are known for is uh, we, we have this, the luck of being called the first positive university in the world. And uh, this, this has been recognized in different forums. Uh, we, we have been recognized in the United Nations. <laughs> Sorry about that. OCDE, uh, the IPEN uh, in, in Mexico, in, in, in the United Arab, uh, Arab Emirates uh, and QS also for the different approaches we have had. Uh, we develop uh, what we call an ecosystem of well-being and happiness. And all of our courses and all of our student life is based on this uh, circle that you may not be able to read because of the size of the screen, but uh, I, can, I can share it later if you want to. But what we are trying to do here is to, to help students develop different uh, elements of well-being according to PERMA's uh, Martin Seligman model and then adapted by a uh, different uh, number of things uh, like positive emotions, um, engagement, positive relations, achievement, physical well-being, mindfulness, and all of this is all always related to purpose in life, which brings me to say uh, one big part of this ecosystem was uh, help, helped to be developed by uh, David Cooper Ryder from uh, Case Western, and uh, of course um, the help of people like George here, George Beyond here, of, uh, into, and, and the relation to him to flourish, where we can help our students to become um, conscious about the importance of doing well and doing uh, fine in, in, this, uh, in, in the world. And uh, we, we on, on this 2020, we have been able to teach our, all of our staff, which is almost 5,000 teachers, all of them are adjunct teachers, um, we do not have any full-time faculty in the university because of our uh, model of, of classes, which I can talk later about it. And today we are offering more than 25,000 sessions uh, by Zoom or Teams or any other uh, activity. Um, I'm also uh, very proud to say that we have been able to maintain the student life uh, what we call student life at home with almost 20,000 students doing workshops and, and you will not believe this and, and, and I will not have time to explain it but we do have uh, swimming classes through Zoom. I don't know how. I, I, I do know how but it's, it's, it's very strange and how can we do that and we are also uh, working on well-being uh, check-ins every week with our students and also uh, working with all of our mentoring and mentors and counselors on weekly forums where they can share about how their students are feeling and how they are uh, struggling and what can we do with them. And let me just show you a, a, a last uh, uh, slide where you can see in the bottom part of it that we do, uh, we, we work with our students' emotions and we have, we, we have shown, we have, we have discovered that our students is better prepared for dealing with this kind of, um, of crisis through the development of well-being uh, competencies like mindfulness. So today that everyone is talking about mindfulness, our students has a mandatory class on mindfulness for 16 weeks at the start of their bachelor degree. So they are must used, not, not completely used, but must uh, used to, to do meditation and to do well-being checks so in, in physical well-being and also in emotional well-being. And I, I think uh, I can talk a little bit more about that later because I want to talk to you about what we see in the future and wh what's the importance of international uh, students exchange in the, in the next years. So that's my participation, David, and I'm one second left. <laughs> Luis, you're, uh, you're right on time. That's terrific. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, so um, uh, coming back to uh, Northeast Ohio, uh, um, I'm going to ask John uh, Holcomb if he wants to spend a few minutes uh, presenting about Cleveland State and uh, your international activities. Hi, thank you very much. So yes, I'm John Holcomb at Cleveland State University. One of the hats I'm currently wearing is Interim Dean of the College of Graduate Studies. I started this role in April. And part of that involves being sort of the manager of our special program for international students that we call Cleveland State Global. Uh, Cleveland State has been committed to Cleveland and Northeast Ohio as an anchor and an institution. We even put those words into our university vision statement. And as a beacon institution, we've long attracted international students to study and then work in Northeast Ohio. 
And in our university value statement, we talk about accessibility and affordability as key university values. This is proving true for our domestic students who are often first generation students, as well as our international students who are first generation as well. Uh, we're committed to upward economic mobility by providing an affordable education, again, for our international and domestic students. And with our price point, even with the out-of-state tuition premium that's required by state law, we're an attractive place for international students. And Northeast Ohio is a welcoming place for our international students. We have world-class attractions. In recent years, however, we saw a trend of declining enrollment. And we decided to take uh, an aggressive approach to reversing this trend. As part of that, we partnered with a private company known as Shorelight. Shorelight is an international student recruitment company that had previously worked with 17 other universities around the country. There was only one other university in Ohio that they had partnered with, and that was the University of Dayton. So in February of 2019, Cleveland State University became the 18th university to partner with Shorelight. This partnership slowly began in February, or I'm sorry, in fall of 2019 with three international students, but took off in the spring 2020 semester with over with nearly 220 international students coming from primarily to study computer science, information science, and engineering. This Shorelight partnership, this Cleveland State University Global Program, we provide hopefully a cradle to career experience for our international students. And Shorelight um, begins as students express interest in studying abroad. They provide a personal counselor to our applicants to help them um, decide on a major field of study and to streamline the application process. They provide pre-arrival guidance. In particular, they help students with the visa process. There are webinars and checklists to prepare for their visa interview and coaching to help them for that interview. And then they also provide assistance on all the required paperwork to get that F1 visa to study in the United States. When they do come to the United States, we provide campus transition supports that involve airport welcoming, student and parent orientations, cultural group outings, and an academic accelerator program, which is credit bearing coursework to help acclimate the students uh, to academic work here at Cleveland State. And I could talk more about that later if we have time. Then once they start their classes, we provide academic support in the form of tutoring and English language help. And then the big thing that we provide is uh, career growth, professional development, which involves resume writing and LinkedIn profiles, but mainly internship assistance. As you may know, there are two internships programs that Homeland Security allows our international students to participate in a CPT program, curricular practical training, and an OPT program, optional practical training. We try to maximize the opportunities for our students in both these internship opportunities. And we're so grateful to the businesses of Northeast Ohio that enroll our students in their in, in internship programs in their companies and allow them to continue even on to gainful employment. So the, this partnership is, um, took off in, in January. Um, we've hit some interesting challenges in the age of COVID that I could talk about later if people are interested, but we're very excited about this boom to both CSU and Cleveland and bringing more international students to our area. John, thank you. That's, uh, that's terrific. Very impressive um, and uh, uh, interesting to know what's, uh, what's happening. Okay, um, now I think we go to uh, both a Cleveland-based and a, uh, a Mexico-based uh, uh, presenter. Uh, George, you're, I think you're last. Unfortunately, it looks like uh, Elena 
hasn't been able to get on, if if you can hear us and you can get on, uh, we will have you present. But I don't see your uh, your screen up here. So uh, so George, you're you're on. Yes, uh, fine. Thank you, David. And uh, very interesting listening to to all of you. <clears throat> yes, uh, I'm connected with uh, Aim to Flourish. That's uh, uh, hosted and and born. Uh, in, at the Fowler Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit. I love that title. I, 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 I saw that title years before I got involved and, and it, I just connected with it. Uh, the Fowler Center uh, for uh, Business as an Agent of World Benefit. I have been working in organizational development as a cult, as a, consultant and professor for for years uh, that that really connected with uh, what moves me in my consulting and coaching and, and teaching uh, helping business to to become that the agents for good uh, uh, to be successful uh, and in name to flourish that's at, K, at the weatherhead school of management that case uh, what what we do, and well, I my role is as you mentioned, I've, I I have uh, two hats here. Somebody mentioned about hats. Uh, 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 well, I really have both feet, I guess, in at Case at Weatherhead at the Fowler Center, and and I, I have uh, my heart <laughs> in Latin America uh, and uh, doing it and uh, helping uh, professors at uh, many universities to uh, be able to use the aim to flourish resources in Spanish as well as in English and lately uh, as of now in Portuguese to prepare their students uh, in the methodology of appreciative inquiry uh, which is a strength-based uh, uh, way of conversing and listening and connecting uh, with the uh, person being interviewed to bring out the best, uh, the, the high moments. And, and we do that uh, so that the students uh, can go out, leave the classroom virtually now uh, and interview a business leader in their community or in another part of the world which uh, which many have been doing even before COVID, you know, uh, on Zoom or whatever, uh, doing an appreciative inquiry, uh, uh, looking for how that particular business uh, is connected with uh, one or more of the global goals. In other words, contributing to uh, solve uh, humanity's uh, most pressing problems. So with that lens of the global goals and with a posture of listening, bringing out the best in that business person or innovator or entrepreneur to get them to talk about their project, about what they have done, about their business, where it came from, what inspired them, what enriches them, uh, what motivates them to, 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 to keep moving on. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience for, for the students, uh, that one-on-one -on -one contact with a, with a, a business person um, and doing business in, in, a, in, in a different way. It helps the students to, to, see, uh, to change their mindset uh, about, about business. And that's what many of the students are saying. You know, I just didn't realize you could do business like this. You know, I had a different image of what it was like to do business. So just a little bit about the numbers, uh, 15,000 uh, students have participate in the Aim to Flourish assignment, uh, which is going out, interviewing, then uh, coming back in, in, uh, individually or in a group of three or more, uh, write up the, the, the story, uh, pub, uh, write it up on the Aim to Flourish platform, uh, with the help of the, uh, the, the professor, reviews it, 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 it complies with uh, the requirements. And then uh, for, for Latin America, you can, they can do it in Spanish or Portuguese and then have, translate it. So you see both languages published 
on once the edi editorial uh, volunteer editors uh, approve it to be published uh, on the site. At the moment, there are 2,700 plus stories published by students, student authors. Isn't that great? Uh, so they're getting to know businesses. Uh, there, uh, uh, there are 101 universities from around the world with published stories. Uh, 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 Tech Millennium is one of them. Uh, of course, Case is, is another one. <laughs> And uh, we're hoping that Ken and John and Luca at uh, your uh, universities will also join us. And uh, I guess I'm about at five minutes, uh, David. I, I haven't, I guess I'm on Mexican time, so. <laughs> <laughs> George, thank, thank you very much. Uh, appreciative inquiry is really a, uh, uh, a strength, I think, uh, of the, uh, the Weatherhead School and of the uh, Fowler Center. It's, uh, it's quite a remarkable uh, tool that, uh, that I think gets used. Um, I, I will add one uh, little bit to this and then want to open up the, uh, the conversation, uh, which is um, uh, Case Western Reserve um, is a, um, a tier one research university. We actually have more graduate students than undergraduate students. But what we found uh, for this fall uh, is that uh, because of uh, visa restrictions, uh, many of our students haven't been able to get to uh, the United States. Uh, what has been, I think, remarkable, uh, and, and I'd be interested in hearing from other university uh, uh, leaders, uh, what's been remarkable is that um, for, for at least our undergraduate students, um, they have uh, continued uh, their work uh, virtually. So uh, if they're in China, if they're uh, in India, uh, wherever they are, uh, we, we actually created a relationship with a university in China uh, where 185 of our students, um, mostly undergraduate, but some graduate and professional students, uh, are physically uh, on the campus of um, uh, Xi'an Jiaotong University, uh, but taking our courses remotely. It's quite a remarkable uh, uh, relationship and the students seem very happy. Um, in fact, we joke that the only place where Case Western Reserve students are having what you would call a normal college experience is in China because they can go to the library, they can go to the, uh, uh, the sports facilities, they can actually uh, be in classrooms without masks uh, uh, on. Um, uh, our graduate student numbers are down a little bit, uh, but as I say, our undergraduate student numbers are up. The, the real question is going to be, as we move forward, uh, you know, what is all this going to look like and uh, will there be changes in uh, the whole question? Two, two questions. One is student mobility uh, and the other is sort of the definition of, uh, of internationalization. Um, and that's really what I want to turn to and, and ask our uh, our panelists for the next uh, uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, what do you see as the, uh, as the future uh, of international higher education um, on the one hand? And how do you see, uh, given that we're at a, uh, a global Cleveland sister cities conference, uh, how do you see uh, universities in Cleveland uh, reaching out to uh, and working with uh, either your university, if uh, if you're not a Cleveland-based university, uh, or uh, or how do you see your university working with Cleveland uh, Cleveland-based universities? Uh, what what's the best model? How how best to think about it, especially in light of of the uh, COVID uh, issues and coming out of the COVID issues. Um, and uh, I don't I don't really want to. Well, I can call on people, or you can just. Uh, unmute and begin to talk. And if we have people talking over each other, then I'll be the moderator and say, you know, who's going to who's going to go. So anybody who wants to to begin with that conversation, go ahead. And and before we begin, I would ask our uh, uh, anybody who's who's out there in the ether, if you have uh, questions, please type them into the uh, uh, t to the um, area where you can type in. Uh, and I'll try to ask them to our panelists uh, towards the end of the session. So, um, so anybody want to 
uh, want to begin with uh, with that? Go, go ahead, Luis. Uh, David, uh, I, I believe uh, our students in, in Mexico, I, I, I will talk about them. Uh, our students in Mexico, 35% of our students are first generation students. Most of them has never lived their home place. And uh, that's because of economical reasons or uh, any other kind of reason that they may have. But, uh, and our students are not pursuing a, a, a degree after graduation. So they need to work and they want to work. 98% of them has a work on graduation day. However, 100% of them want an international experience uh, as a part of their university studies, as a part of their university life. So I believe one of the most important things to do after, after COVID is uh, we, have, we have learned as universities that we can do a lot of things online that we didn't think we could do before this. So we have learned that uh, we can establish uh, remote labs for our engineering students. We know we can do co-op semesters as we do in, in, with companies inside uh, for students to, to learn from their home. So I think one other thing that should be included there is we know that we can do international uh, experiences without leaving home. And that's not the best for, for the whole cultural um, uh, work and the whole cultural uh, experience of our students, but it is we are able to do it. We're doing projects today with Chile and Peru and Spain and Germany, and, uh, different countries. So one of the things that Tech Millennial would like to do from this uh, panel is uh, we are open to hear and we are open to work with you in, in, the, in the different universities that, that may be uh, seeing us on how to do these uh, experiences uh, from home today and maybe later from 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 without, uh, from, from outside, I'm sorry. But then uh, what I think that we should be doing is how can we do joint projects with cities like Cleveland, what we, we know that has a very um, industrial uh, manufacturing companies in there. And what we are looking for our students to obtain is work experience and work uh, culture is very important for us to look for that. So uh, any kind of projects where we can work from home as may be the, the new normal in the, in, the, in the next years that people will work from home uh, for, for, from wherever they are, they can work. Uh, so I think we, we can learn that part and we can learn how to work and we, can, we should be teaching our students how to have uh, experiences from home uh, and, and they, can, uh, they, can, they can relate to other cultures like we're doing now, we're from different backgrounds. And we should be teaching our students that. So we are, we are very much open today for not waiting for COVID to pass to do international uh, uh, exchanges, but uh, doing it in, in what may be the new normal for the next, maybe the next two, three years. That's my opinion. Thank you. Okay. Can I continue? Yeah, uh, I think I think you did a very good job describing exactly what's going on also around the world on 60 universities that we teach at and, and at the University of Ljubljana. Uh, University of Ljubljana is the work is undisturbed and actually if we look at the good points, good points, I mean if we look at the better positive uh, sides of what is happening night, right now that is that new ways of teaching and researching actually don't mean worse quality they 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 offer many many possibilities of the conferences actually the turnout right now at the conferences is greater as the cost of the traveling and time constraints and everything else that uh, people have with that are greater also the students that are coming in are having many many more so to the uh, university of Ljubljana in person are having many, many more um, uh, opportunities to get information because everything was digitalized in these uh, past months, everything. So the exchanges, the ex archiving the documents, the contracts, the certified signatures, and so on and so on and so on. So certain things are much easier now than they were before. Of course, research got a little bit less governmental money in the other research but COVID research. So there it's a little bit of a problem I, I see uh, with this situation with the, with the exchange programs. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, the, the, the meetings are great. We have all sorts of uh, equipment. Uh, a lot of stuff that we were doing before went completely undisturbed. 
uh, students have been coming to the to the seminars for Slovenian language, literature and culture and so on. They were very happy about being it online. The only downside, as you said, is the cultural uh, culture. Uh, yeah. I Colin, can you, thanks. Uh, well, interesting that the two comments, one from, uh, in some senses, Slovenia and one from uh, uh, Monterey in, in Mexico, uh, same sort of thing, that there's real upsides to, to what we're going through. Um, and in some ways, what we're doing this morning uh, represents those upsides. I mean, where could we have a conference uh, in person where uh, we have two people in Mexico uh, well, Luca, you're actually here, but some of the time you're in uh, Slovenia, that we could all be together. Uh, uh, yes, some of the time people travel to do that, but a lot of the time it's too it's too time intensive and and too expensive. So, um, so anybody else want to comment on this uh, this issue? Uh, John, go ahead. I think that I agree with our two previous panelists, and, and maybe this addresses Elena's question in the chat. Um, I think this COVID pandemic has made us realize there's another mode of delivery, and that is this online course delivery in a, in a synchronous manner where students log in at a particular time and they have a structured course. I, um, at, at Cleveland State, most of our other online offerings were always asynchronous, just providing these resources for students to learn and then they could learn on their own time, which certainly has its own merits and values. But what we're, what we're exploring right now is this semester is we have, um, in our partnership with Shorelight, we have something called CSU Live, where we're offering courses in the morning here in Cleveland, and then that's the evening in India, so that's courses both during daylight and get the online and course experience. And we've mixed those courses with students that are here in Cleveland, with students that are also in India um, to provide that synchronous experience using a special custom made platform that Shorelight's developed, which is kind of like Zoom on steroids. And so we're just finding that that's an opportunity to really reach our international students without them having to leave home it also brings the students uh, a, an experience and a commitment to our university, which we hope will help them through the visa process if they decide that they want to come to Cleveland and, and finish their degree in person to take advantage of all the, you know, the cultural things once COVID eases and they're allowed into the country. Um, that should prove to the, to the um, customs officials that they're serious about their education because they've already invested time and effort in, in, uh, in courses at CSU. So we're excited about those opportunities now during COVID and moving forward. Okay, any others, George? Um, yes, I've, I've been thinking about this question, your, your question, uh, David, you, you asked about the, if I wrote it correctly, the internationalization of higher education. <clears throat> And I'm, I'm looking at internationalization and, 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 uh, and, uh, and the opportunities that we have. Um, I think COVID has uh, opened our eyes. It's been a wake up call uh, and open, I would hope to expand our consciousness that we are all connected. I mean, uh, uh, and interdependent and I'm, I'm I'm seeing internationalization uh, and, and through that experience of being aware that we are uh, all connected, that uh, it, it, to, to, to come out of national uh, or, uh, you know, mindset or, or our particular private or public university as the center and, and seeing another field of, uh, connection of action of sharing of diversity um so i i, I think there's there I, I see many answers to your question emerging for example I, I see students even before this happened maybe they knew about this already but uh in aim to flourish for example uh all of a sudden i realized that there were some students uh in different universities that were 
that were uh, interviewing um, uh, businesses in Latin America. And these are students from the United States or others. And I thought, gee, here's a, here's a story from Chile. We don't have a professor in, in, in Chile, you know? He said, oh no, this was written by uh, somebody from Ohio, a student from Ohio. So they, I think the students kind of have that tendency like somebody said, they want an international, like you said, at least they want an international experience. It seems that they're, they're teaching us at the same time. Um, I guess we can listen to our students and kind of go with the flow and help uh, each other collaborating and with other universities to, uh, to, to collaborate among universities and uh, governments and other organizations. Um, that that's where your question took me, David. Uh, George, thank you. Um, uh, just to just to build on that a little bit, um, what what I had uh, sort of thrown out about uh, educational diplomacy um, at the beginning of this, uh, you know, we all think about diplomacy as as sort of a government to government uh, exercise, but uh, the real work. Uh, goes on at a at a sub government level. I think we all we all sort of understand that in many ways is really getting to understand uh, people and institutions, um, and educational institutions can really lead uh, can lead the way in that. Um, you know, I think of of some of the work that uh, that we have been doing uh, with our um, with our uh, uh, counterpart uh, universities in China. And we know how China is being portrayed in the United States today uh, on a government level. The question is, can, uh, can we work with universities in China to figure out uh, how we can do research together, but do it in a way that's ethical and transparent and that we don't, uh, uh, we're not sharing state secrets, et cetera. Um, those are the kind of conversations you can have at a university level. Um, so, so that's one example. The, the other that, that I would sort of throw out to, to everybody uh, is that we in international higher education have really uh, sort of measured ourselves in one of two ways. You know, how many international students do you have coming to your university and how many students from your university do you have that are, that are going overseas? And I, I'm not sure that even before this, uh, that was how we wanted to define internationalization. You know, don't we want to have students e e either uh, here at our institutions uh, or uh, somewhere else uh, that understand how they're going to be able to work in the world? Luis, you, you, I think, said it very well that your students can be working in Chile or Peru or presumably the United States, even if they're sitting in, in Monterey uh, or Cancun, I guess. Um, and um, uh, and that's really that's really the question is is how do we get there uh, and how do we measure that? Um, so I'd I'd uh, open it up to anybody else for a last uh, one or two comments, and then uh, I see that it's ten twenty six, and we have four minutes. Da to go. David, one, one thing uh, I think Colin sent you a, a video of Elena uh, because she's not able to uh, to connect, so we can watch it. Basically, it's three minutes yeah. long. He okay. sent it in the in the chat. I can share my screen. I have it up. She uh, emailed okay. it to me. So why don't why don't we watch that? And this will be the, uh, the the end of the, and then I'll come back and just wrap up the session. Okay, great. Thanks, Colin. Okay. Can everyone see it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. But I don't think we hear anything. I'm not sure if there's no. anything to hear about. You couldn't hear anything? Let me. I couldn't know. Can you hear anything currently? Uh, no, but I, I would put on the video because we're going to have to sign off here in a second. So.
Thank you. Yeah. I'm happy I was able to. Th thank you. So, uh, Elena, thank you. If you can, if you can hear us. Um, well, I'm sorry that we have to end the session because we, I think, are getting into some of the meaty issues. But I knew that uh, an hour with uh, with six uh, panelists was going to be difficult. Uh, I want to thank all our panelists: uh, George Dion, uh, John Holcomb, uh, Elena uh, Par Para Bochaya, who uh, unfortunately couldn't get on, uh, Luis Gutierrez uh, Aladro, uh, Luca Zabelnik. And Ken Schneck, um, appreciate uh, you coming on and sharing your wisdom. Uh, I think we have uh, lots more to discuss. And uh, Luis, I think you were the one that said it, uh, at least uh, for those of us who are on the panel, uh, I think it's worth uh, continuing a conversation about how we can uh, potentially work together. I know all of our universities have uh, a variety of relationships, but uh, the idea here is to really strengthen uh, some of these between uh, Cleveland and uh, universities around the world. So, um, so thank you all very much. Uh, have a uh, have a very good day, and uh, I encourage you all to uh, watch the uh, uh, the other sessions uh, in the uh, in the sister cities uh, week here. Uh, and I want to again thank uh, thank our sponsors, uh, the Cleveland Public Library, Platform Brewery, Downtown Cleveland Alliance. Supply Side Group, Omar and Byrne, the Rotary Club of Cleveland, Eaton, Taiwan Sister Cities, uh, the Council on International Programs, Margaret Wong and Associates, Team Neo, the Peace Corps, 12 Literary Arts, and Growth Ops. Uh, it's a big list, and thank you very much. Uh, appreciate all of you, and uh, thanks to everyone who was here uh, at the session. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you, David.